Welcome to a Legendarium special about John Ball, Medieval England's Revolutionary Priest. In this installment, we will talk about the man who called for the abolition of the feudal system in the 14th century. John Ball was born in St. Albans around the year 1340. Twenty years later, he served as a priest in York. He later became the priest of St. James Church in Colchester. Ball believed it wrong that some held boundless wealth while others could barely keep the pot on the boil. Ball's sermons criticizing the feudal system upset his bishop, and in 1366 the bishop removed Ball from his post as priest of the church. Ball had no fixed job or income now, and he became a traveling priest who gave sermons wherever he found a few people ready to listen. By the roadside, on a village green or in a marketplace, the homeless priest poured forth fiery words against the evils of the day, and particularly the sins of the rich. The authorities saw him as an incessant heretical nuisance, preaching in churchyards and daring to criticize the established church as a conspiracy of the rich. Influenced by another radical preacher, John Wycliffe, Ball urged people not to pay tithes to the church and urged for the Bible to be published in English. While preaching in Norfolk during the year 1376, Henry Le Dispensor, Bishop of Norwich, ordered John Ball's imprisonment. After his release, he again toured Essex and Kent. During this time, he became known as the Mad Priest of Kent and soon returned to prison. Several times, Simon Sudbury, the Archbishop of Canterbury, locked Ball in his private prison for his sermons. Whenever out of prison, Ball preached that things would not go well in England until everything was held in common. At these meetings, he argued, They are dressed in velvet and furs, while we wear only cloth. They have wine and spices and good bread, while we have rye bread and water. They have fine houses and manners, and we must brave the wind and rain as we toil in the fields. It is by the sweat of our brows that they maintain their high state. We are called serfs, and we are beaten if we do not perform our task. Ball also complained about laws telling people what to wear and what to eat. He especially objected to a law that forbade peasants from sending their children to school or to go into the church to become priests. Such laws had only been passed in the last few years because the Black Death left the country depopulated and the lords became desperate to keep a steady supply of agricultural labor on their estates. In Ball's words, we find the early concept of universal equality. Such fraternity, justified by scripture, continued as a basic ideal of the English radical tradition. In 1379, King Richard II called Parliament to raise money for the continuing and miserably failed war against France. After much debate, Parliament chose to impose another poll tax. However, the government based its sums on the pre Black Death population, which meant it failed to raise enough money. Of course, Simon Sudbury, Archbishop of Canterbury, in a show of Christian charity, proposed a second poll tax at three groats ahead. John Ball toured Kent giving sermons that attacked the poll tax. When the Archbishop of Canterbury heard about this, he ordered that Ball should not be allowed to preach in a church. Ball responded by giving talks on village greens. Sudbury now gave instructions that all people found listening to Ball's sermons should be punished. And when this too failed to work, Sudbury ordered Ball arrested and he entered Maidstone Prison in April 1381. At his trial, Ball supposedly told the court that he would be released by 20,000 armed men. His prophecy proved correct when the tax collectors came to Essex. Their brutal commissioners checked girls' virginity to see if they qualified for the tax. When one put his hand up the dress of a 14-year-old girl, her kinsmen attacked him, and an enraged mob drove the commissioners out. After assuming command, rebel leader Watt Tyler marched to Maidstone and freed John Ball from prison. He immediately became the religious leader of the rebellion, for the rebels truly wanted a man of the church to give God's approval for their rebellion. 
The peasants arrived in Canterbury on June 10, 1381. Here they took over the archbishop's palace, destroyed legal documents, and released prisoners from his jail. More rebels broke into manor houses and destroyed legal documents that made them peasants. These records included the villeins' names, the rent they paid, and the services they carried out. What originally started as a tax protest became an attempt to dismantle the feudal system. By the next month, John Ball joined the peasants in a march on London. John Ball sent a message to Richard II stating that the Rising only sought to deliver him and his kingdom from traitors. Ball also asked the king to meet with him at Blackheath, an offer the king dithered on. Though Richard II ordered the rebels shut out of the city, one of the gatekeepers lowered the bridge and thousands of rebels marched in. For a time, they wandered about awestruck at the size of the city, its huge houses and towers and generous merchants offering them free beer. However, Ball kept his eye on the larger goal. He incited a crowd at Blackheath with the popular text, When Adam, Doug, and Eve span, who was then a gentleman? Ball even urged the killing of lords and churchmen. At first, young King Richard II gave the rebels whatever they wanted, and most of them went home with charters of freedom in hand. However, a core group of 30,000, including Ball, remained in London. Ball led the peasants in storming the Tower of London, where he and his men seized Simon Sudbury, chopped off his head, and paraded it through the streets of London. At another meeting, King Richard II personally met with Watt Tyler, who demanded the effective abolition of the feudal system. However, something happened, and the Lord Mayor of London addressed Watt Tyler's concerns with a sword. For a time, it looked as if the showdown would end in slaughter. Instead, young King Richard II rode forward, declared himself the rebels' leader, and offered them pardons if they dispersed. They did, and this gave the authorities the time they needed to crush the rebel remnants. The king's officials received orders to look out for John Ball. They finally caught him in Coventry and took him to his hometown of St. Albans to stand trial. He denied nothing and freely admitted the charges without regrets or apologies. The court sentenced him to death, but William Courtenoy, the Bishop of London, granted Ball a two-day stay of execution. He did so in the hope he could persuade Ball to repent of his treason and save his soul. John Ball refused and he was hung, drawn, and quartered on July 15th, 1381. Those who called themselves his betters struck John Ball's head on a pike and displayed it on London Bridge. Each part of his quartered body went on to show at four different towns where he preached, yet the ideas he preached never truly died. That wraps things up for this episode of The Legendarium. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, press like. If you want to see more, press subscribe. And if you've got anything to say, let me know in the comments section. Thanks again for joining me, and I hope that you have a great rest of the day.